Well, we've been looking at three relationships that uh, somebody said it can't help. Uh, I got the oh yeah. <laughs> All right, well, you missed the part about the spot. I'm glad about that. I'll just keep going in from there. Anyway, if you've been with us either in person or online, you, you know the book of Ephesians is a book of a unity, and we, in most of the recent parts of this book, have been talking about the three, three very important relationships in our life, that being the husband-wife, the parent-child, and last week we talked about the employer and employee relationship. Uh, these relationships are found in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 29 through Ephesians chapter 6 verse 9 and they're all and all of them revolve around this idea of mutual respect uh, found in the ver the first verse of it 5 529 where it tells us submit to one another out of reverence to Christ so we're supposed to be good to each other and today we're going to talk about the opposite of, of our unity and that being Politicians, you know, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, those conservatives, etc., etc. No. You will be interested to know that these things, these people, uh, that some would say have led us to the most disunified time in our nation's history, are not to blame. And then the question is, well, who is to blame? Would it be would it surprise you if I told you it is the devil? So, some of you might say, oh, come on, Mark, the devil doesn't cause these things to happen in our nation. Or, what about the unrest in our own families? That's not the devil, that's my wife. Or, that's not the devil, that's my husband that causes these things. Or, what causes the rebellion in our families? Well, that's, that's our, my children. Now, don't get me wrong, before I go any further into this, I want you to know, I'm not trying to absolve any of these people of fault, especially those who call themselves Christian. Unity should be our trademark. Yet, um, yet, uh, what? Where does this all come from? All this division come from? Well, that's in our text today. So I'm going to tell old Jacob to come on up here and share with you Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. And as usual, I didn't give him a pre prep on this. He's always ready to go. Thank you. Finally. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the evil, against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for your word. God bless it today. Help us to take these scriptures and apply it. To our lives. Help us, to God, to be convicted where we need to be convicted. God, help us to be encouraged where we need encouragement. And then, God, at the end of today, let us go out from this church and be, and be better equipped to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, you know, I kind of like that. I like this, uh, this. these next few weeks we're talking about the armor of God. And when I was in college playing football at Liberty University, we had to have a Christian service. It was required. And if you were on the football team, everybody had the same Christian service. It was called the Men of Armor. And because we were the Men of Armor, you know, we took that from Ephesians and we went out to high schools and, and grade schools and we put on programs and then we had things at the church and we gave the gospel out. It was a lot of fun. But this morning we're going to go to the source of our strife and the origins of our struggles in life. And it says in verse 12, For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. And then it says, uh, so we're going to find out, number one, how do you prepare for a struggle against these evil forces? Well, it says in 10, finally, it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
You know, somebody once said, and I think it's true, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And I think that if we're not prepared to fight this fight against these spiritual dark forces, we're not going to, to, to succeed at it. We have to have a plan, in other words. Um, when it comes to winning this battle, we find ourselves, and, in, and if we're going to wing it out there and go it, on, uh, go it alone, you're kind of destined to fail at that. You can't just wing it. There is no neutrality in this, ba in, in this battle that we're going to fight against the devil here on earth. Uh, John MacArthur in his commentary commenting, commenting, commenting on these verses said this, and I quote, A Christian who no longer has to struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil is a Christian who has fallen either into sin or into complacency. A Christian who has no conflict is a Christian who has retreated from the front lines of service. End of quote. If you could be immune from this battle that we find ourselves in, wouldn't you think that Jesus himself uh, would be free from attack? But uh, we know that when Jesus came down to earth and put on this robe of flesh, he was attacked by the devil too. too. And, and, and the devil, in the very beginning of his ministry, right before he started his public ministry, in Luke 4, 2, it says, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. This is Jesus. And he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. So Jesus was tempted for 40 days. Was it over then? No. What about the end of his ministry? You know, the devil attacked Jesus trying to keep him off the cross. He didn't want that to happen. And, and that's why in Luke uh, twenty-two forty-four 44, we see this. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Our perfect example of how we are to live showed us that during his life on earth, how to stand up against the attacks of the devil. Uh, we look at these things, we're going to look at these things for the next few weeks to come, and we're going to get a taste of them today, about our, our fight against the devil. In the next verse it says, verse 11, the first part it says, put on the full armor of God so that you would be able to stand against the, the excuse me, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm. That's the that's first part of, of chapter, of verse 11. You know, getting ready to fight this battle is essential to success. God has supplied us with the armor we need to defeat the devil, but it's up to us to put it on. Well, that's why, what does it say in that, 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 that verse? It says, put on the full armor of God. That's up to you. You've got to put on this armor. And if you're going to do something for God, and don't expect, don't, don't expect it to go easy. You know, uh, some people think that the litmus test for uh, something that you're doing for God is right, is that thing, that life is easy. But, uh, but Christ, uh, uh, but, but look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 a. He says, but I will stay on in, at Ephesus until Pentecost, because this great door of effective work is open for me. And where, and where are, there, and where, excuse me, and there are many, who opposed me. Don't miss that last part. He said there's, there's this great door of opportunity. But he said, don't get this. The last part said, there's going to be many who oppose me. And you got to expect that. You know, I'm talking to Bob this morning. I said, I'm getting ready for the next summer's um, volleyball soccer camp, maybe or even a baseball camp. And I expect some resistance to that. We're getting ready to start an FCA group back at, Fred, at Reedley High. I, I expect the devil not, not to want that to happen. I expect some resistance to it. So you can't be discouraged when you, get, you hit some roadblocks. You got to just keep plowing on. So if you're going to live for God, don't be surprised if you run into opposition. That's more of a reliable litmus test of than everyone speaking well of you. This is because we have uh, an enemy, and that's my point three. In the next part of that, verse 11, it says, against the schemes of the devil. In our modern day, I'm told a growing number of people don't believe in the devil. You know, they just think that's just some funny thing kids dress up in on Halloween. But it's interesting enough that there is also a growing number of people that are getting involved with the demonic occults and things like that. Uh, the operative word here is the word schemes. 
It means craftiness, cunningness, and deception. The devil is a real person, and he is talked about in the Bible a lot. He's talked about as the chief angel, the anointed cherubim, the star of the morning in Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, Ezekiel 28, 1 through 10, and Revelations 12, 7, 9. I wish my, my, my uh, thing on the, on the thing didn't wear out or you see some of this, but yeah, I got, uh, what do you call it, uh, outlines back there in the back if you need them. Uh, he, opposed, he appears in scripture in the form of a serpent. That's in... Uh, that's, a, that's to Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 3.1. In 3, Jesus not only spoke about Satan in Luke 10, 18, John 8, 44, and John 12, 10, he spoke to Satan and with Satan in Matthew 4, 3 through 10. Paul, Peter, James, John, and the writers of the Hebrew all speak about him as a personal being. In Romans 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 2, 11, 2 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Hebrews 2.14, James 4.7, 1 Peter 5.8, and Revelations 12.9. They talk about him all over the Bible. And if you, can, you can't ignore this fight, it's going to come at you. And what does the devil do to us? How does he oppose us? How does he afflict us? It says, first of all, he, he, he's opposed to God's work. He's opposed to anything you do for God. And in Zechariah 3.1, it says this, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side, accusing him. You know, every time you're trying to do something for God, there's Satan over there saying, you dummy, this is, yeah, that's not going to work. That's, that's no good. Don't try it. It's, you're you're going to fail. It, it, number two, it, he perverts the, God's word. Matthew 4, 6 says, and this is Satan talking to Jesus, he said, if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You now here, Satan is trying to encourage Jesus to throw himself off a cliff and attempt suicide. He says, if you really sense to God, nothing will happen to you. And Christ rebukes Satan, saying, you're not supposed to take God's word out of context. And then he reminded him, this says, you will not put the Lord your God to a foolish test. Don't put the Lord your God to a foolish test. You know, what is a foolish test? Well, God, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do it if, 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 you make, if, if you give me a hundred bucks right now. You know, that's a foolish test. You know, these are things that you do sometimes that, that, that don't make sense. And it's thirdly, hindering God's servants in 1 Thessalonians 2.18. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan blocked our way. But Satan blocked our way. You know, sometimes you're going to try to do things for the Lord, and Satan's going to block your way. You know, certainly it, it could be in the form of uh, something health-wise. You know, uh, my wife had valley fever really bad for a while, and, and she had some things she was going to do for the Lord, but it, it delayed it because she got valley fever. Um, hindering the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Satan, who is the god of this evil world, has made him blind, unable to see the glorious light of the gospel that is shining upon him, or to understand the amazing message we preach uh, about the glory of Christ, who is God. You know, some people um, are just blinded to the gospel. You know, say, hey, why, why can't they, why won't they let me help them? And they reject and they reject and they reject it. Well, sometimes Satan gets a hold of the heart. And, they, and, they, and, and it says, like even with Moses when he went to Pharaoh, it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart, I think, one, two, three, four times. And finally he says, Say, God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There's a point where you can reject God and reject God and reject God. And finally you say, I'm done with it. And, and that's a sad time because that's the time where you enter into a, a moment of no hope, no chance. It's snaring the wicked, 1 Timothy 3, 7. Also, he must be well spoken of by the outside, outside the church, those who aren't Christians, so that Satan can't trap him with many accusations, accusations and leave him without the freedom to lead the flock. You know, we see this all the time, is they say, you know, people like to say, you hypocrite, you're preaching up there, but I saw you do this. I saw you do that. And a lot of times Satan attacks us and tries to destroy our credibility. And we need to take responsibility. We need to walk in a way worthy of God. 
six, number six thing that Satan will do is appear as an, an angel of light. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, how could God be opposed to that? I mean, it just seems so nice. And, 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 and a lot of times, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, And no wonder, for Satan himself matches parades as an angel of light. Some of the things that are wrong in the Bible, people say, how could that be wrong? they got to be right. And so, fighting the archangel Michael in Jude 9, I thought this was very interesting. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring slanderous accusations against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. You know, if you're going to stand against the devil, know the God's word and use it. And don't use your own personal opinion. Because a lot of times when you start spewing out things you're against, you come out very unloving. But I, I really encourage you to use God's word to, to rebuke any evil that you see. He brought sin into the world, and the whole world is under its power. you got to understand that, too. 1 John 5, 19 says, We know that we are children of God, and that all the rest of the world around us is under Satan's power and control. Do you know that all the world around us is under Satan's power and control? And so, you know, like an old preacher I used to listen to on radio, I'm an upstream Christian in a downstream world. Well, you know, you 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 you, could, you you might feel like that sometimes. You could be an upstream Christian in a downstream world, but the world is no friend to God. And so don't be surprised when it stands up against you. Going back to our text, verse 12 says the battle for we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. You know, as a Christian, we... We, by virtue of uh, Christ living in us, has the ability to be victorious over the dark um, forces of evil in this world. But we're left with no excuse, and we're left with no excuse in this world to give ourselves over to be a slave to sin. You know, sometimes uh, Christians get in the grips of, of sin, but you, but you have the ability, if you have Christ living in you, not to have that happen. But as powerful as we are in the face of evil. With Christ, without Him, we're hopeless. We cannot defeat the devil apart from Christ. We need Him to be in us, and we need to be conscious of it. Number five, the victory of believers' warfare. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when, you, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. You know, in football, and I know I use those examples a lot because I was a football coach, forgive me. But in football, you could be the greatest athlete in America. But if you fail to put on the armor of the game, you'll die out there. You know, I don't need no stinking helmet. I don't need no shoulder pads. You know, uh, you know that's like going into the world and saying, I'm a winner. I'm a winner, and I don't need salvation. I don't need prayer. I don't need God's word. I just win by virtue of my own flesh. Now, that's as ridiculous as going to any NFL stadium this Sunday and, and wearing flip-flops, gym shorts, and a tank top and say, hey, give me the ball. I'll win the game for you. You won't make it out of the first quarter. Now, where my, my example kind of breaks apart is in football, when you're done with the game, you take off the armor of, of, the, of the game. But in, in life, you keep this armor of God on you 24-7 because the attacks are coming 24-7. You never leave yourself exposed to the attacks of the devil. Now, how do you apply all this to your life in 2021? Well, popular opinion is a very poor gauge of your spiritual walk or of what's right. The Bible is the best gauge of your spiritual walk and what's right. Look at Luke 6.26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. You know, if you stand up for God, you don't have to be in your face guy. You're going to rub some people the wrong way. They're going to be uncomfortable with you. They're not going to want you around because you, the, your lifestyle speaks out against them. There's no Switzerland in the, in when it comes to our faith. You either are on one side of this fight or the other. And there's no neutrality when it comes to our faith. Yet, I think when it comes to some churches and colleges, I think that call themselves Christian, there is a desirable, a desirable, a desire to be palatable to the world. And in doing so, they deny the word of God. 
Uh, I'm going to confess something to you. I've been a critic sometimes of Fresno Pacific University because I felt they drifted too far to the left when it comes to the Bible. Yet last month, the board voted not to allow the LBGTQ plus club on campus there. And the reason they cited was that Christian was their Christian biblical beliefs. As a result, some members of the faith community, some students, some faculty members have voiced, voiced opposition to this decision. I don't doubt that the world at large will condemn them for what they've done. Can they stand, though? That's the question. Can they stand by taking this discipline? thing? Of course you can. As long as you don't take off your armor, God of God, because as long as you are clothed in it, you, we will fight the battle and we'll fight it in love. And that's, that's, that's true. We don't want people to feel that we're, we're out of love. We, we love them. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, one of the things they referencing to is the Bible not being approval of that is Romans 1, starting with verse 26. It says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed uh, with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts and received in themselves the due punishment of their error. And in this verse 32, I think this is America and in where it stands in a lot of places today. It says this, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, they, but they also approve of their practice of them. Isn't that sound like some of the things we're doing in life today where we know God's word, but we're saying, well, yeah, but we know better. This is my question of the day to you. Is it more loving to approve of things that according to God's word deserve death? Or is it more loving to say no to them? You know, secondly, I want to say, if there's any common ground, is there any common ground between the conservative, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching Christian and the LBGTQ community are liars, adulterers, fornicators, murderers, etc. Yeah. But what is it then, Mark? What, what is this common ground? It is that I, too, am a sinner, no better than those are those groups who, uh, of people who have sinned. And the difference is I have given my life to Christ. And in doing so, I've confessed my sins, I've repented, and I've allowed Christ to have control of my life. And if you're going to do that, it means that you have to surrender to God's word. And if God says, no, don't do it, you've got to be willing to not to do it. You say, you say well, what if it doesn't make sense to me? It doesn't have to make sense to you. You know, you know it, it has to be because God said so. You know, that's why you do it. And, and that means you have to, you know, do, uh, do I do that all the time as a, as a Christian? No, I mess up. You know, just ask Mary. She'll tell you, I, get, I, I mess up a lot. But you know what? God gets a hold of me with his Holy Spirit, and he convicts me, and then I know what i got to do. i got to make it right, and then i got to go, and, 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 and i got to confess it to God. i got to make it right with whoever I fed, and then i got to move on and, and follow God's word again and, and, and accept his forgiveness, free of guilt, free of pain and sin. That's what God calls us to do when we mess up. How can a sinner like me expect to be forgiven and be capable of living a good life? And this is the answer. You don't, you're not capable of living a good life apart from Christ. It says in Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not die for you because he didn't die for the ones that were good people already. He died for you when you were, uh, when you were separated from God in sin. And by the way, it says all of us were separated from God in sin. And at, at that point, Christ died for us. Amazing. And now, I can't make my life good enough to merit heaven or God's love, but God loved me when I was still a sinner. But sin is serious stuff. Don't, don't let me undersell that. If you refuse to live a life devoted to God, if you refuse to, if you think you've got the better way, then I'm going to tell you this. Romans 6.23 comes into play. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God paid this enormous price for our sin. Yet, uh, let's not reject 
His forgiveness and love. Are you willing to live for Him today? He loves you. And, he, and are you ready to give your life to Him? Romans 5, 9 says this, Since we have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? You know, I'm not going to make it to heaven on my own, my own accord. I do it by faith in Christ alone, who gives me the strength and the forgiveness of to, go, to, to be acceptable to Christ. So the question is, will you trust God today? Are you going to fight the devil on your own? Or worse yet, are you going to give up to the, with, to, the, to the devil with the world's thoughts and philosophies? Is it okay with you that, hey, I know this is wrong, and the reason I know it's wrong is because God said it's wrong? Or do you have to have, you know, the commentators on the newscast tell you that that's, that's a good way to think? Or do you have to have the popular opinions tell you that's the way to go? I'm asking you today to trust God and trust God alone. And if you want to, God is as near as your next prayer. And he's ready to help you. Put on the armor of God. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for your love, your understanding, and your guidance, God. And God, if there's anybody here or listening to us on, on the podcast that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, God, let them know that you died for them while they were still sinners. Not when they cleaned themselves up. But God, if they're ready to live for you, God, just let them give their life to you by just praying. God, forgive me my sins. Come into my heart. Lord, help me to live each and every day for you. Thank you, God, for dying for me. Now help me to live for you. And Lord, for those of us that know you as Savior and Lord already, God, don't let us get derailed by the devil. God, let us put on the whole armor of God. As we go through the next few weeks in this church and we talk about what the whole armor of God means and what it is, God, let us take it up and stand against the devil and all that he throws against us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Close with uh, number 477. Stand up for Jesus. 477.
your word. Thanks to the Lord, even though we can't face the enemy alone, we can't stand by ourselves. But you promise to be with us, to give us the power, to give us the tool that we need to stand against the enemy. Help us to go from here, Lord, and live a life of, uh, of power and of confidence and in your strength in every, uh, in every situation.